I am the kid moving ninja. Hi, Internet! And welcome to Kid Movie Ninja with your hosts, Fighting Leaf and Husky the Wolf. After watching The Lion King, we've generally been trying to avoid any more Disney remakes. A general consensus has been reached that they're a waste of everyone's time and yet annoyingly profitable, so we're still gonna be seeing more of them. But then something came along to break down our walls of indifference and get us to say something. Now, the Snow White remake isn't news anymore, but it did get us down on a little bit of a rabbit's hole in which we reviewed a lot of the usual, uh, criticisms lobbied against the classic Disney films. Today, we're gonna tackle some of those complaints one at a time and explain exactly why they're dumb. But first, as always, let's set a few ground rules. The thing we're not going to do is talk about historical context. These films were made, obviously, for a different time period and a different audience with different cultures and expectations. All we care about is how these movies affect people here, now, as they are. And no one's over here saying that these films are perfect, we're just saying that people are generally mad at them for the wrong reasons. And so, without further ado, let us tackle the proverbial poster child of these problematic princess films, Cinderella. Okay, there's a little more ado, but bear with us. The first charge that this movie is generally accused of is revolving around a woman's desire for a man. Oh yeah, this is totally true. Look at her sobbing and moaning over being denied a night with her man. Look at it. Look at it! Except let's take a proper look at what happened just a moment before. Cinderella had lost all hope for going to the ball that evening, only to find out that her small animal friends had finished her dress for her. This gave her all kinds of hope, and she was all excited about going to meet her man, right? WRONG! I've gone through every single line of dialogue in this entire movie up to this point, and I have heard her mention the prince himself exactly once. Sort of. I'd be honored, your highness. Would you mind holding my broom? <laughs> well, why not? Whoa, whoa, whoa there! Grab your friggin' enthusiasm, girlfriend! One could read the lines delivered by the sisters as being completely accurate, fully reflecting Cinderella's wishes. But let's take a deeper look at the context here. Yeah, earlier that very scene, it's the sisters and the evil stepmom who are all obsessed with the idea of tackling the pants off the prince. I want you to keep this in mind. Except keep the prince's pants on when you do. It's the villains who are overtly obsessed with the prince. Well, is Cindy covertly obsessed with him? Well, I'd like to point at something that says definitively, no, she is not thinking that, but you can't really prove a negative. The best you can do is just say that there just isn't anything to support it. Now let's revisit that dress shredding scene again. The anachronistic dress she has on right now was cobbled together from bits and bobs that her sisters cast aside for not being pretty enough, and they didn't even recognize them on her at first. Once Lady Tremaine, the evil stepmother, pointed it out, however, they all attacked her in a jealous fit, ripping her dress to shreds. Meanwhile, the base dress she had on actually belonged to her late mother. Her hopes were raised that she got the chance to actually go to the ball because the dress was finished. And those very same hopes were dashed because of a violent attack perpetrated by people who had been mistreating and abusing her for years. And now she's sad because she can't find her man. Where does it say that? There are so many other relevant factors that would drive a grown woman to tears in this situation that the prince, who she has barely mentioned, is virtually irrelevant. <sighs> but... It would be irresponsible of us to not cover one bit of the film that could contradict everything we've mentioned so far. She does mention the prince here being handsome and stuff, yes. Post-production Professor Cabbage here, and I double-checked. No, she actually does not even say that much. She is only talking about how wonderful the ball may or may not be. You know what she doesn't mention, though? Like, at all? Marriage. 
Cinderella desperately wants to go to the ball. She even wants to dance with the prince, but that's not the primary goal. The primary goal is to just have an evening of not living hell to look forward to. The goal is having a single evening of fun in a life of horror, misery, tragedy, woe, and just living nightmares of pain, suffering, and agony! <laughs> From the very beginning of the movie, all she's primarily concerned with is getting through her day-to-day -day life. Here's proof! This is the introduction to her character. The first thing she talks about is dreams. And we all know what her dream is, right? Actually, we don't. She never actually says what this dream of hers was. We're left entirely in the dark about it. So anyone saying that it's the prince she's dreaming about is literally making stuff up that ain't there! There is exactly one point in this movie where Cinderella's mind shifts to obsession with the prince. So let's talk about it. After the ball, Cindy made her post-midnight escape. And you know how she felt after not getting her man that night? Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. She is literally thanking her fairy godmother because she got what she wanted. Mission accomplished. She got all she wanted. Getting married to the prince wasn't even a possibility. At one point, the proclamation from the king lets everyone know that they're looking for whoever fits the famous glass slipper Cinderella left behind. Of course, the villains are all over this, but you know who else is? We've got to get dressed. Dressed. Oh, yes. We must get dressed. Yep, she's lost it. Right there, she sees her very first realistic out from this living nightmare that she's a part of. Who wouldn't shift her priorities after that? Let's take a look at those charges again. The whole movie? Absolutely not! There is a point where the passing of the king's examination is her goal, but to claim that the entire movie revolves around it is false. Not only that, but the moment he becomes her goal? It's completely understandable, come on! All right, that's one round of defenses down, and now it's time to get transparent for a moment. Yeah, if any of you nerds have any counterpoints to this or any other points we make, we're gonna look them over. If we get enough, we plan on making a follow-up video to address some of those points. If we don't get enough, we'll just assume that we made a good enough point and move on to the next thing in our lives. This is basically us just trying to boost our engagement artificially. But don't use the word algorithm in your comments. We're pretty sure YouTube ignores those. Now, on to the next point. The next charge? The film promotes love at first sight. With the implied understanding that such a thing is unrealistic and even potentially dangerous. All right, let's take a look at what the movie actually shows us and come to a conclusion. To the bomb! First of all, the film is self-aware enough to walk through the beats of their initial meeting. He looks up. Hello. There she stands. Everything happens exactly as the Grand Duke guy describes it, and, well, how else would it happen? I mean, it's Cinderella. We know how the story goes. Which is kind of the essence of the charge itself. Let's keep going. The two of them dance, and we compress time between them by way of a pretty forgettable musical number about falling in love. And yeah, we've checked. This is the only significant time they spend together in this version. While there is an obvious connection here, given the many hours they spend with each other caring about virtually nothing else... She canonically leaves the ball at midnight and arrives sometime after 8 p.m. That pretty much means that the prince saw her across the room, was immediately intrigued, and didn't really feel like dancing with anyone else the entire evening. So, yeah, the prince just did what guys have always done whenever they see a hot chick. What about Cindy? Cinderella's situation is a little bit different. When someone endures a lifetime of abuse and horror, they have a tendency to form quick attachments to those few individuals who treat them well. Basically, Princey Pooh here lucked out because he had little competition for her attention specifically. Heck, she didn't even know he was the prince, just some guy who didn't royally suck. That being said, the best we're able to do for this charge is to show that her reaction is actually pretty understandable given her circumstances. Yeah, the charge of flagrant use of love at first sight pretty much still stands. But it is this critic's opinion that, at least in Cinderella's case, the trope is sufficiently justified. Poor Cinderella. And we got nothing to counter the idea that glorifying love at first sight this way is bad. 
So in this case, the charges still stand, even though it's a freaking fairy tale, so it shouldn't matter as much. We're not bitter, you're bitter! <laughs> so what's next on the docket? This film has one more point for us to address, and it reads as follows. The heroine does nothing to help herself when she should. Is that so? Is that... freaking... so? Can I help you? Hi there. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what you want, but whatever it is, Victoria did it. Shut your pie hole! Ah! We have a very simple question to ask. Yes? You. Your life sucks, right? N yes. So, how easy is it to get yourself out of an abusive family situation? Uh, I mean, uh, without being, without having the proper support system, you really end up in a, out of the frying pan in the fire situation. Can I please go home now? Well, you heard it here first. It is very easy to get out of a situation like that. Wrong! The movie starts off talking about just how poorly equipped Cindy was to deal with that sort of thing. Lady Tremaine acted sweet and kind while Cinderella's father was alive. It was only after he died that she showed her true colors. The early part of the film revolves around what she actually does to deal with her situation. Dreaming about something better. Holding on to hope in spite of everything. She also goes on to explain by implication why she doesn't do more to escape physically. This is Bruno. He has a dream about ripping the evil stepmom's horrible demon cat to bits. Catch him this time. That's bad. Bad? But why is that? It's hard for us as general media consumers to really understand, but in these situations, the fact is it's usually better to focus less on offense and more on endurance. Yeah, Cindy knows that trying to fight the system will have real consequences that she ain't equipped to deal with, but even then, she don't always just roll over and take it. It's not much, but when her sisters shout that she shouldn't go, Cinderella stands up for herself, insisting that the invitation from the king gave direct orders for all eligible maidens to attend, and she fully qualifies. Then there's how she doesn't take no crap from Lucifer. Yes, that's the stupid cat's name. It's not much, but what power she does have, she puts to use. Then there's the ending. When the prince comes and saves the day, right? Wrong. I mean, what? You mean he doesn't? OMG, big shock and surprise! First off, it wasn't the prince who came to them, but the Grand Duke. Second, remember earlier when Cinderella learned he was coming? Oh yes. We must get dressed. Yeah, she don't care no more. Each time the opportunity presented itself, she jumped at it like a dainty little wolverine ready to rip its throat out! Odd analogy, but he's basically right. She defied her family when the king made the general proclamation of inviting everyone to the ball. She defies them day by day by continuing to hold on to hope in spite of her family situation. And if she were as big a wimp as people say she is, she would not have turned around and sicked the freaking dog on Lucifer when he was playing keep away with the key to her room during the Duke's visit. True, she didn't create any of these opportunities herself, but any of them could have slipped through her fingers if she didn't act on them. And there's also one more thing that she did that was extremely important. Building a good, strong support system! I could use some support right now. NOBODY ASKED! It may not seem like much, and it gets a bad rap for being stereotypically Disney, but her kindness to the birds and mice basically gained her friends for life, made people care for her. And she ain't just being passively sweet to him either. She gives him food, little outfits, and just generally makes their lives better, asking nothing in return. And yet it's these acts of love that motivate these creatures to return the favor to her, once again out of love. And it's also this selflessness and hope that she holds on to, which manifests the fairy godmother. No, this is never overtly stated in the movie, just strongly implied, right here. If you'd lost all your faith, I couldn't be here. And here I am. The fairy godmother is clearly a being of hope and love, and her general reward for her endurance in the face of hardship.
And the real point of the movie is that hope and love create the tools needed to overcome the evils of everyday life. Real, sincere love that asks nothing in return ironically gives back. And the ability to hope for a better day keeps one open to these possibilities when they finally do arrive. Is the movie perfect? No, of course not. It's a flawed product just like anything else. But the reason we're defending it and other movies like it today is because people criticize and lampoon it for completely invalid reasons. They're trying to fix stuff that ain't actually broken. The weird flaws in this movie are really just conventions of the genre. Not just fairy tales, but animated family flicks, too. Everything seen or heard in this type of movie should be taken with a grain of salt because that's not really how real life works. But that's okay. The thing to criticize is how much fun you had along the way. Speaking of salt, you think that girl we kidnapped knows how to make sandwiches? Only one way to find out. Oh, bugger off, you two! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry guys, I had that girl shopping list between my teeth. Okay, we got, uh, what does it say? So strawberries, coconut water, uh, veggie burgers, ew. Coconut pocky, coconut popsicles, good grief. Baby coconut, she eats babies! And I'm here for it! Edible glitter, I am less here for it! Rainbow carrots? It's like a pit okay, what? How does that even work? And when Frozen I you, sushi? I eat Why do you freeze sushi? Uh, you, you, fruit, you, you just eat it. it. It's there and you eat it. What's the point of freezing it? It's never... <sighs> whatever. Disney princess goldfish crackers. Oh boy, and seaweed. Eat with a lot of ease in it. Uh, water enhancers and uh, spicy popsicles. Oh no! I think we picked up a crazy person. Oh boy. <laughs>